Let us pray. Our Father, we thank you once again for the privilege of coming before you to study your word together. Lord, we are asking that your spirit will quicken these words that we are reading and studying tonight in Jesus' name. And Father, we pray that you help us to see the depth of meaning in your word for every one of us in Jesus' name. Bless us, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Tonight we are continuing with the study of the book of the Psalms. And we are looking at Psalm 15 today. Short, a very important Psalm. Psalm 15, straight from verse 1. Lord, who shall abide in thy tabernacle? Who shall dwell in thy holy hill? He that walketh uprightly, and walketh righteousness, and speaketh the truth in his heart. He that backbiteth not with his tongue, nor doeth evil to his neighbor, nor taketh up a reproach against his neighbor. In whose eyes the vile person is contemned, but he honoreth them that fear the Lord. He that sweareth to his own hurt, and changeth not. He that putteth not out his money to usury, nor taketh reward against the innocent. He that doeth these things shall never be moved. The first verse asks a question. The second to the fifth verses provide the answer. Verse 1 is the question coming from man. Verses 2 to 5 form the answer that God himself gave in answer to the question of man's heart. For many centuries, men and women have debated about death and about life in the hereafter. Many have been confused by answers from men, that is, men without the true revelation from God. But this we know, death is certain. The only question we need to ask ourselves is, where do we go after death? That's another way of asking the psalmist's question. Lord, who shall abide in thy tabernacle? Who shall dwell in thy holy hill? As for the fact that death is certain, look at Hebrews chapter 9, verse 27. And as it is appointed unto men once to die. But after this, the judgment. Notice the word appointed. It is appointed unto men once to die. I'm sure you know about appointments. Sometimes there's an appointment for you to see an individual. The time may seem far away. Eventually, the time will come. Sometimes our children at school. They have the appointed time for their examination. Because the time see, still seems far away. They might be playful. But the time that seems far away will eventually come. Sometimes a man or a woman might have made appointment of the day of wedding. Because the day appears far away. They do not make adequate arrangements for them to get their wedding done. But eventually the appointed day will come. It is appointed unto men once to die. That appointment for many people may seem far away. But for many people, even though they think it's far away, at an unexpected time, the appointment will come. And after that appointment of death, then comes the judgment. You ought to begin to think. Should, should the appointment come earlier than you expect, what will you do? Many people do not think that death will come. They live as if there is no danger or there is no fear in Psalm 89. Verse 48. What man is he that liveth and shall not see death? Shall he deliver his soul from the hand of the grave? Sealer. The sealer there, there means pause. It means what I tell you often when I preach to you. When I say, think about it. So the psalmist is saying, what 
Man is he that liveth and shall not see death. Think about it. Shall he deliver a soul from the hand of the grave? Think about it. It is telling us that death is a common experience. But for many people, it comes unexpectedly. I'm sure you read in the papers yesterday of the football that took place on Saturday. And before that uh, football game ended, a man that had been respected internationally, who felt very honored that he was playing for his country, he dropped down, he died. We're told that when the game began, he was dancing and he posed before the cameraman, before the photographer, and said, take me, take me. He never knew that the appointment of death was so very near. You see, many people are like that. They do not know how near the appointment is. That's why the psalmist was asking, Lord, who shall abide in the tabernacle? Who will dwell in your holy hill? We need to think what will happen to us after death. Where do we spend eternity? Why are we here now? How do we prepare to live with God in eternity? We need to consider our ways. We need to prepare to meet the Lord. In answer to David's question, the Lord has given us the requirements for eternal fellowship with him in heaven. The wise will listen and prepare. The foolish may neglect and perish. We look at three things in this psalm. Number one, clear conversion. Number two, Christian conduct. Number three, complete consecration. These things are very important and they are linked together. You cannot have truly Christian conduct without a clear conversion. On the other hand, a clear conversion cannot stand alone without being followed up by Christian conduct. And without complete consecration, your conversion will be doubtful. Not only that, you will not have the divine ability or enablement to live a consistent Christian life in Christian conduct without a complete consecration. So then you see that the three points are tied together. Let's look at point one. Verses one and two of Psalm 15. Lord, who shall abide in thy tabernacle? Who shall dwell in thy holy hill? He that walketh uprightly and walketh righteousness and speaketh the truth in his heart. Stop there. Let's search for the man. Where do we find him? Can we find him in Jerusalem? Can we find him in Bethlehem? Can we find him all through the land of Canaan? Can we find him in the household of the king? What's the answer? Look at chapter 14 of the Psalms. The foolish has said in his heart, There is no God. They are corrupt. They have done abominable works. There is none that doeth good. Remember, we are searching. For he that walketh uprightly. We are searching. For him that walketh righteousness. We are searching. For him that speaketh the truth in his heart. In verse 1 of chapter 14, it says, There is none that doeth good. We can't find any. Well, maybe God will find somebody. Verse 2. The Lord looked down from heaven. For upon the children of men to see if there were any that did understand, that seek God. They are all gone aside. They are all together become filthy. There is none that doeth good. No, not one. As God looked and he sought for somebody walking uprightly. Walking righteousness and speaking the truth in his heart. The Bible says in verse 3 of what I've read to you. All have gone aside. All together they have become filthy. There is none that doeth good. No, not one. Why? Because we were all born in sin. Because in sin did our mothers conceive us. In Psalm 51. Verse 3. For I acknowledge my transgressions, 
and my sin is ever before me. Verse 5. Behold, I was shapen in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. Psalm 58. Verse 3. The wicked are estranged from the womb. They go astray as soon as they be born, speaking lies. Where can we find them? He that walketh uprightly, that walketh righteousness, that speaketh the truth in his heart, when it says, they go astray as soon as they be born, speaking lies. Let's look at Isaiah. Chapter 64. Isaiah 64. Verse 6. But we are all as an unclean thing, and all our righteousnesses are as filthy rags, and we all do fade as leaf, and our iniquities like the wind are taking us away. So then you understand that on the face of the earth, among all children of men, among all those that are born by women, there is none righteous, no, not one. How then will it be possible that a man will eventually be able to walk uprightly, walk righteousness, and speak the truth in his heart? There's only one way. It is by conversion. That's why I've said the very first qualification is that man will be converted. Because what you read in Psalm 15 is not possible for the natural man, for the unsafe man. If a man is going to have this, he must be, by the grace of God, converted, born again. It is only that through the experience of conversion, or the new birth, that a man can walk uprightly, work righteousness, speak the truth in his heart. In John chapter 3, verse 3. Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Lord, who shall abide in thy tabernacle? Who shall dwell in thy holy hill? Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. He cannot live righteously. He cannot walk uprightly. He cannot speak the truth in his heart. It takes conversion. Verse 6. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. In sin did my mother conceive me. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. Behold, I was shapen in iniquity. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. They go astray. As soon as they be born, speaking lies. Therefore, for the natural man who has not been born again, he cannot live by the requirement or qualifications of Psalm 15. You need to be born again. That which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Marvel not that I said unto thee, ye must be born again. It is at the time you are born again that the grace of God will come into your life. Let's look at Titus, chapter 2, verse 11. For the grace of God that bringeth salvation has appeared to all men. The grace of God that bringeth salvation has appeared unto all men. Can you notice here, religion does not bring salvation. It is the grace of God that bringeth salvation. You see, there are many people that say they are religious. They say they read the Bible. They say they go to church. All the religion in this world cannot bring salvation to a man. It is the grace of God flowing through Christ. Don't you remember how we sing it? Grace, grace. God's grace. Grace that is greater than all our sin. Marvelous, infinite matchless grace of our living God. That's the grace that can wash all your stains of sins away. The grace of God that bringeth salvation has appeared unto all men. Then, when it comes to you and you catch it and you receive it, 
And you believe in the grace of God for your life. And your sins are forgiven. It does something in your life. It teaches you. Verse 12. Teaching us the denying ungodliness. And worldly laws. We should live soberly. Righteously. And godly in this present world. You need to underline that in your Bible. In this present world. There are many church goers today. There are even many people that profess they are born again. But they do not deny ungodliness. They do not deny what they lost. They cannot live soberly, righteously, godly in this present world. But if you are going to make it straight through to heaven, you will need something in your life. You will need to be born again and you will need to walk in the way of the Lord righteously. Let's go back to Psalm 15. And let's see now Christian conduct. Please remember what I told you. That clear conversion is linked up with Christian conduct. If a man says he has been converted, let's look for Christian conduct in his life. If a man says he has Christian conduct, let's ask him when he was converted. You cannot have one without the other. Now do you know some people that say they are born again? And when you see their lives... It appears that there is no Christian conduct at all. They cannot live. They are not living as a real Bible believer. Jesus put it this way. Look at Matthew chapter 7. Verses 13 and 14. Enter ye in at the straight gate. For wide is the gate. And broad is the way. That leadeth to destruction. And many there be that go in thereat. Because... Straight is the gate, and narrow is the way, which leadeth unto life, and few there be that find age. If you notice very carefully, the gate is linked with the way. If you notice very carefully, we are supposed to enter the kingdom of God through the gate. But notice, you are not to stand at the gate. You keep walking in the way. You know what that means? The gate, that's conversion. The way, that's our Christian conduct. Which means you enter at the gate so that you can walk in the way. Which means you get converted at the gate so that you can live in Christian conduct. Walk in righteousness all through the way. Now let's see this Christian conduct we're talking about in Psalm 15 i read to you from verse 2. And brothers and sisters, here is where we need to listen to the Holy Spirit. Because you see today, there are many kinds of Christians. That is, those who say they are Christians. And there are many kinds of churches and preachers. Have you opened Psalm 15? Let me show you something here. Verse 2. He that walketh uprightly, and walketh righteousness, and speaketh the truth in his heart. That talks about what a Christian does. What do you do? Three things there. Walk uprightly. Walk righteousness. Speak the truth in your heart. But look at verse 3. He that backbiteth not with his tongue, nor doeth evil to his neighbor, nor taketh up a reproach against his neighbor. What do you find there? You find don't. Here are things that Christians don't do. And you find the words not, no, no. Which means here are things that you must not do. What does that mean? It means if you are going to get to heaven, there are do's, there are don'ts. Do you know there are preachers who say they never preach negative messages. What they mean is they never tell people what you shouldn't do. They say their messages are always positive. They say they never say thou shalt not. They say they are not preachers that will tell their congregations thou shalt not, thou shalt not, thou shalt not. You know what that means? They will never tell their people thou shalt not back backbite. You must not do evil against your neighbor. They say they can never preach that. Now take up a reproach against your neighbor. I need to tell you this. 
that if those preachers don't preach both the do's and the don'ts, they'll never prepare their people for heaven. Not only that, do you know there are people that say, I can't go to that church because there are a lot of do's and don'ts in that church. A lot of rules and regulations. They say, all I want, anything that will turn me on, that will excite me, will be just positive declaration alone. They say, I'm fed up with preachers that will tell you a lot of don't, 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 don't. All I want is, do this, do this. I want something positive. My friend, if you are going to read your Bible, all right. There are do's, there are don'ts. Now think about this. Some of the qualifications are stated positively. The things you ought to do. Some of these things are stated negatively. The things that you ought not to do. And I want you to notice something here. All the verbs here, they are in the present tense, but the continuous tense. Look at it. He that walketh uprightly. Walketh, that means you walk, you are walking, you continue to walk until you see the Lord face to face. Walketh righteousness. Continuous present, always. Speaketh the truth. That means you do that always, every time. Verse 3, he that backbiteth not, you never do it. Know that, well, I wasn't doing that last year, but now I do a little of that. You never do it. Backbiteth not, nor doeth evil. It's a pattern consistent Christian life that you are living, that you never do evil. Nor taketh up a reproach, you are committed to that in your lifestyle. In whose eyes, a vile person is contained. He honoreth them. He continues to honor. He continues to appreciate. He continues to love and respect the people that fear the Lord. He sweareth to his own heart. And I tell you this, there are Christians who used to consecrate to the Lord, but today they have no consecration at all. But this one says, he keeps on swearing to his heart, and he keeps on keeping the vow. He changes not. Which means, a Christian never stops consecration on this side of heaven. He sweareth to his own heart. He promises the Lord. He commits himself to the Lord. He keeps on, keeps on all the time. Laying everything upon the altar. And he never changes. You know what that means? He keeps to 100% of all his consecration. He doesn't pull back on his self-denial, on his vow, on his commitment, on his consecration. He puts not his money out to usury. It doesn't matter the condition of the country. It doesn't matter about the economy. He will never take unlawful gain. He will never take bribe. He will never be covetous. He will never have the love of money. He never puts his money out to usury. Nor taketh reward against the innocent. He that doeth these things, that is, if you keep on doing this continually in your life, shall never be moved. Let's examine them more closely. Come back to verse 2. He that walketh uprightly. Remember, David was asking a question. Who will get to heaven? Who will live with God in heaven? Who shall abide in thy tabernacle? Who shall dwell in thy holy hill? Then it says, He that walketh uprightly. What does that mean? To walk uprightly. What does that mean? To walk before the Lord. Upright, blameless, perfect, and righteously. Well, it only means one thing. In short, it means to walk like Jesus Christ. I want you to look at First John chapter 2 verse 6. He that says he abideth in him ought himself also so to walk even as he walked. That's what it means to walk uprightly. It means to walk like Christ. Whatever you do, whatever actions come out of you, ask yourself, is it, is this how Christ walked? If you are tempted to be proud, ask, is that how Christ walked? If you are tempted to cheat other people, ask yourself, is this how Christ walked? If you are tempted to get things from other people without paying for it, ask yourself, is it how Christ walked? 
If you are tempted to sin or to do evil, ask yourself, is this how Christ walked? He that says he abideth in him ought himself also so to walk, even as Christ walked. Are you tempted to be careless in your life? Ask yourself how Christ walked. Because if you are going to get to heaven, you must walk uprightly. Look at Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4. Verse 17. This I say therefore, and testify in the Lord, that ye henceforth walk not, as other Gentiles walk in the vanity of their mind. What it means is this. All around us are Gentiles. In your place of work, if you are a civil servant, there are Gentile civil servants. They don't know the Lord. They are not born again. And if you say you are a Christian, walking uprightly, that henceforth you will not walk as other Gentile civil servants walk. What do those civil servants do? They will leave their normal work assignment and they will go on sideline trading. Maybe they have some clothes they want to sell. They will leave the work they are really being paid for every time and they will take those clothes all around. Work not as other Gentile civil servants work. Are you a Christian teacher at school? You will see many teachers around you. And these teachers around you, instead of teaching the children that they ought to teach, they will not teach their children. They will be doing some other things. Work not as other Gentile teachers work. Are you a trader? There are traders all around you too. That they will try to sell spoiled goods. They will try to sell things that have lost value to the people they are selling things to in the market. If you are a Christian and you are a trader, that ends you will not work as other gentle traders, gentle market women work in the vanity of their mind. Have you seen that there are people who are co-tenants living with you? Many of them not born again. And they will do things that are not according to the word of God. Work not as other gentle co-tenants work in the vanity of their mind. Let's go back to Psalm 15. Verse 2. He that walketh uprightly and walketh righteousness. What does that mean? Walketh righteousness. The Lord told us in Matthew chapter, chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5 verse 20. For I say unto you, that except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees, ye shall in no case enter into the kingdom of heaven. We need to think a lot about this. I think a lot about this. A lot. Because I ask myself, what does it take to make it to heaven at last? Now, see this. The Pharisees and the scribes were religious people. They were devoted religious people. And Jesus said, I say unto you, that except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, ye shall in no case enter into the kingdom of heaven. And let me tell you something, and you must pay attention to be able to understand. If you don't pay attention, I don't think you will understand. You see, all around us, we see people who are devoted to religion. Very, very devoted to religion. And, you know, I think about Muslims all around us. And I deeply respect them. Don't misunderstand me. I know they need Jesus. Don't misunderstand. I know they need the grace of God. But I deeply, deeply, deeply respect them. You know what? There are Muslims that will not allow their vehicles to be used to take you from where you are, Agege or Limosho, and come to the church. You know why? They say they don't want to contribute anything to make it easy for those Christians to go and worship Christ. They say they don't believe in that. Now you, if you have a vehicle, a taxi, and idol worshippers want to take their idols, what do you do? Accept your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of those devoted Muslims, you will in no wise get to the kingdom of God. You know what? There are some devoted Muslims. You tell them, we're building a church, building somewhere. We like to join us and build a church building. We'll pay you for it. They'll say, I'm sorry. You see, they'll say, I'm a Muslim. 
And I cannot go and spend my time and use all that I have in going to build your church for you. I, I am committed to building mosque. That's their righteousness. That's the way they think they will be devoted to their God. And I need to tell you this. Accept your own righteousness. Shall exceed the righteousness of those devoted religious people. Ye shall in no case enter into the kingdom of heaven. You know what? A serious devoted Muslim will pray five times a day. And he doesn't care whether it's at the airport that the bell for, that the time for prayer meets him. He'll push all activity aside. And in the midst of all the people that are watching him, you know what he'll do? He'll just begin to bow to his God. And accept your righteousness. Shall exceed the righteousness of those religiously devoted people. You will in no wise enter into the kingdom of heaven. I discovered something about devoted Muslims. I discover that no matter how poor they are, they will go to the Holy Land. They must. They must. They will sell their property. They will gather together all the money they could have in buying the ticket and going to the Holy Land. They may not be educated. They may not know left from right. They may not know the things that other people know, but they count it very, very important. They might have to sell everything they possess on earth to get to that Holy Land because that's what they believe. I need to tell you this. Accept your righteousness. Shall exceed the righteousness of those religious people. Ye shall in no case enter into the kingdom of heaven. You know, the Muslims will condemn a lot of people. Look at how we are here tonight. There are some people that cannot come to this holy land. This is the holy land. Where this is the only place I know in Lagos here where the Lord can make you holy. Where the blood of Jesus will wash all your sins away. I don't know of any other holy land except this place where the grace of God, the power of righteousness will come into your life and make you holy. Now you tell me, that's the holy place where the blood of Jesus washes whiter than snow. You tell me, that's the holy place where the grace of God will flow into your life and flood your life and make you as righteous as you ought to be. But you know, there are people that cannot come to this holy land. On a Monday night like this, they cannot sell their property. They cannot sell everything that they have to come to a place like this and have the holiness and the grace of God in their lives. I need to tell you something. That except your righteousness, your dedication, your diligence, and your devotedness shall exceed and go beyond the righteousness and dedication and devotedness of all these religious people. Ye shall in no case, in no wise, enter into the kingdom of heaven. Let me tell you this. When I was converted in 1964, there was no gospel church in the town where I was living. The gospel church through which I got converted was 15 miles away. And you think about it. Every Sunday, early in the morning, I needed to wake up and travel down to that place. They never made transportation arrangements. I went myself. I paid for it. And in the afternoon, the church never made accommodation arrangements for me. They only told me that they only made announcements in the church, in the morning service, that there is an evening service. Now it was left for me to decide where to stay in the afternoon and get ready for the evening service. I always did. I never, never, I never came back home after the morning service. I always waited for the afternoon, for the evening service. And you know what? They will close at about after age. And then you have to pray very well before you even went back. And they never made arrangements for me to go back 15 miles back to where I was going. I had to take my money again and travel back. I did that every day for more than seven years. Not only that, whenever they were having their camp meeting in Lagos, never, nothing will ever tie me down. You know what I'll do? Even if the school was having extension, every day I'll come early in the morning and I will listen to the Bible teaching at the convention. And then I'll go back for the uh, extension classes because I was the teacher in the secondary school. The following day, I'll come again. I'm talking about coming from Ikene, far, far away. Coming to Lagos every day for three weeks whenever they were having convention. And I'm surprised today that there are people that cannot take the trouble and come to a place like this. Accept your righteousness. 
shall exceed the righteousness of this Christ and the Pharisees. Ye shall in no wise enter into the kingdom of heaven. Then it says in Psalm 15, verse 2, And speaketh the truth in his heart. Speaketh the truth in his heart. You know there are people that know the truth, but they cannot say it. They know the truth about sanctification. They cannot preach it. They know the truth about restitution. They cannot emphasize it. And they know the truth about loving God with all their heart, all their soul, all their mind. They cannot emphasize it. They know the truth that we should beware of false prophets, like I taught you yesterday. And they cannot uphold it. But the Lord is saying that if you are going to get to heaven, you will not be a person that is compromising. It says that speaketh the truth in his heart. Now verse 3. He that backbiteth not with his tongue. Are there not people here who make it a full time business? Backbiting? Still bearing? Gossiping? Before you get to heaven, you have to clean up your conversation. You have to clean up the way you use your tongue. If you continue to use your tongue like Miriam slandering Moses, you'll be outside the camp. While the children of God have gone in to see the king, you'll be outside the camp. He that backbiteth not with his tongue, nor doeth evil to his neighbor. When somebody's husband is not around, and you go to that woman, and you spend one hour talking to that woman, you are doing evil to the husband. And if you want to make heaven, you must not do evil to your neighbor. Anything you do, which you know will hurt your neighbor, will destroy your neighbor, or will hurt his family, or will hurt his children. If you are going to get to heaven, you cannot do it. Then it says, Nor take us up a reproach against his neighbor. Do you know, if somebody comes to gossip to you, about your fellow brother, about your fellow sister, if you accept it and believe it and act on it, do you know that can hinder you from getting to heaven? Because that means you are taking up a reproach against your neighbor. In whose eyes a vile person is contained. That means he is not a friend, he is not an associate, he is not a companion of wicked people, of sinning people, of backsliding people. Be not unequally together with unbelievers. That's what it means. In whose eyes a vile person is contained, but he honoreth them that fear the Lord. Look at verse 5. He that putteth not out his money to usury, no covetousness, no love of money, but is completely dedicated unto the Lord, that he will even give what he has for the blessing of other people, nor taketh reward against the innocent. Now, brothers and sisters, this is Christian conduct. My question to you is, are you actually clearly converted? Two, do you have Christian conduct? Now, if you have Christian conduct, there's something that we will see in your life. And it is complete consecration. Look at verse 4. The latter part of verse 4. He that swear to his own hurt and changeth not. He that swear to his own hurt and changeth not. What it means is this. You put your hands to the plow. And you do not look back. As I look at the deeper life of today. And I compare the, lives of the, the life of the average deeper life member. With the Bible. I have deep sorrow in my heart. Because I see that many many people do not know what consecration is all about anymore. But if I can give you my own testimony and share, share with you my own life, I need to. Because you need to be able to find somebody to relate with, to be able to say, if God can help him to do that, I can. You see, when I became born again, as a child of God, there were many decisions I took. There are many consecrations I made, swearing to my own heart and not changing. You know, for example... When I was born again, I was born again in a little church. In fact, that church did not have a church building. They just rented a shop. And it was in that shop that we were meeting. But thank God, I got saved there. 
And I will go to that church every Sunday. And then if we had meetings during the week, I will go there. Do you know I started studying music in that church as a member of the junior chorus, not in the choir, because we needed to really learn a lot of music before we could actually sing in the church. And think about this. I will go during the week on Sunday. I told you, 15 miles, I'll go to church and come back. If we had prayer meeting or week meetings, let's say they were having a, you know, revival or whatever during the week, from the 15 miles, I will go and come again. Then I will go for choir practice, for music lesson in the church. Every time, think about it, that I took that decision, there were members of the church that pitied me and said, you don't have to come every time. Our pastor will understand that you are coming from a long distance. I said, yes, I understand. It's not the pastor making me to come. I have sworn to my own heart. I cannot change. Not only that. You know, when I was converted, our pastor was not an educated fellow. In fact, to tell you the truth, one day he called me and he said, please, can you teach me English? Now, you know I'm a Christian. I cannot tell you a lie. He called me and said, can you teach me English? I said, no, sir. I was afraid to teach him being my pastor. Teach him English and be pointing to him say, no, you don't spell it that way. You spell it this way. I was scared. And yet, do you know that everything that illiterate preacher preached, I never argued with the word of God? I wasn't looking at it. I am a graduate and he didn't preach, finish a primary school. That's not my concern. The thing that I know is that, well, he knew the Bible enough to be born again. He knew the Bible enough to teach me how to be born again. That's enough for me. You know, there are people today that are not that committed. Not only that, that preacher, any t every time I saw him, I, I, I loved him. I loved him because he preached the word of God. You see, those days, I didn't even know that preachers used wristwatch. You know, that preacher, he never used wristwatch. Maybe he had it in his hand, but he never looked at it when preaching. He can just preach about two hours non-stop on Sunday morning. And after that service, he will tell us to begin to pray. And it wasn't five minutes prayer or fifteen minutes prayer. It was real prayer. In fact, the pastor that took up after him, you know what that other pastor did? He too could preach like that. Immediately he finished preaching. You know what he will do? He will stand at the door of the church. And if I prayed for 30 minutes and I rose up and I was going, I'll meet him at the door. He'll say, have you finished praying? All those preaching that I gave now, have you finished? He'll say, go back and pray. So, uh, you can't you can bypass him at that door. I mean, the preachers that pre preach to me, they were real, real preachers. And then you'll pray and pray and pray again. Eventually, after 15 minutes, after I've run a uh, short of words, I'll rise up and guess what? I saw him at the gate again. He'll say, you are finished. I won't know how to answer. He'll say, okay, go. But next Sunday, pray more than that. He, he will make us to really pray. And do you know, I never got offended. You know, sometimes say I preach and some of you get offended and you say, how can he preach like that? I mean, one of these preachers that preached to me, you know what he did one day? Because I had not been baptized in the Holy Ghost at that time. And he was, he didn't like it. Because I practiced the organ, practice and practice and practice. I could play almost any of our songs that were singing in church, but I had not been baptized. And they needed me to play the organ. And they won't allow me to play without my being baptized. So one day he was preaching. And he, he, he was unhappy. He left the whole church and he called my name and said, Kumui. He said, uh huh, stand up, you see. He will not pray. Graduate. He can read, he can write, he can do everything, but he cannot pray, he cannot have the Holy Ghost, the organ is there, he is there. You people, do you know he can play, but because he's not as serious about it, then he says, sit down and continue this preaching. I never left the church because of that. I never gossiped about that pastor, and I, I never said, look at how he preached and made me to stand up. I felt he's a preacher, he's a representative of God. And he has the right to do that. The next Sunday I went back to church again. Are you so consecrated? That if I called you by name. And you stood up and everybody saw you. And I preached at you a few minutes before continuing the preaching. Will you come back to church again? He that swears to his own heart and changes not. Let me tell you more. 
You see, in the early days when I became a Christian, I thought, nobody told me, but I felt it would be a sin for me to buy a vehicle for myself when the church did not have a vehicle, when the pastor did not have a vehicle. You know what I did? I saved my money so I could buy a vehicle for the church and for the pastor. And even the pastor did not know that. He will call me and say, look at your dressing. He didn't know that I was saving the money to buy a vehicle for him. He will say, why have you not got married? He didn't know that I had no money to get married. I was saving the money to buy a vehicle for him. And sometimes he will rebuke me and say, you are a graduate and you are dressing like an ordinary fellow. You won't let them know that we have some good people in this church. I'll smile and say, yes, sir. Next Sunday, don't do that. I come next Sunday. I'll come ordinarily again. Oh, he was not happy with me. And I was saving all the money to take care of that church. But I didn't tell anybody. And I didn't allow what the pastor said to hinder me because I've sworn to my heart that I will never change. You know, during my university days, at the long vacation, I could get a job in any secondary school teaching mathematics, but I will not. You know what I did? I'll come to our campground, the campground of the church, and I will take cutlass in my hand, so in my hand, so as to be within the campground and taking block and carrying cement. I was a university undergraduate at that time. I could get vacation job. And you know, I never asked the church to pay me any amount of money for spending my vacation with them. I was serving God. And you know that at that time, I would also spend part of the time in their printing press. You know, collecting the little children materials that were printing for Sunday school. I did it free of charge. I just gave all my time, all that I had. And one of the preachers asked me, what are you thinking about marriage? I smiled. I had no money to get married. I was a graduate. I was too busy to even think of marriage at that time. The time I should start thinking about marriage was 1973, at the age of 32. But that was the very time that we started Deeper Life. And because Deeper Life had not been established, I had to put the marriage aside. Do you know when we started Deeper Life? I had, I think, two short sleeves, shirts of different colors. When this one is dirty, I wear the other one and wash the other one. I had one pair of sandals. I think I had two pair of trusses. You know why? All my money went for printing track. Only one life. Remember thy creator. A little member. The good old days. My lost years. All my money went for printing job and divine healing. All my money went on have compassion on them. I didn't worry about that. All the newcomers that came in, you know what I did? I bought Bibles for them. And other Christian materials for them. You see, that is swelling to your heart and changing all. You know why I'm telling you that? Because, look at the back of your outline, please. And you see there, we need to advertise. What a shame. I never knew that the church could so go down to this point that we'll be looking for architects. We'll be looking for site supervisors, cashier, male clerk typists and storekeepers and electrician and security guards. I will have to be writing it at the back of the outline before people will do it. Oh, in my early days of the Christian life, I gave my all, everything. You know, I didn't get married in time. Many of you who know me, you know that, uh, you know, pretty old. I'm not a young man. And at the time I married, my own junior sister had had a child about, um, you know, maybe more than 10 years of age. My own junior. You know, I knew all that. And I knew the people who were Christians together. Why didn't I get married? You know, in the early days of deeper life, if I got married, where would I get money to print tracts? When I have to buy baby food and buy nappy and buy all those things. I said, no, not yet. No, not yet. So that you will be saved. So that you will be saved. So that the church will be established. Now, we have given our very life blood to get you saved. You are giving nothing. Your life. Your time. Your money. Your attention. Your consecration. The Bible says, He that swears to his own heart and changeth not. What do we stand today? Lord, who shall abide in thy tabernacle? Who shall dwell in thy holy hill? The answer is there. Do we qualify? Let's rise up and pray. When the trumpet shall sound, where will you be? You want to do something for the church you are looking for money? You want to do something for the church you are looking for a thank you? You want to do something for the church you want us to beg you? 
You want to do something for the church and we have to write it at the back of the outline? You want to do something for the church you cannot consecrate and sacrifice? You want to do something for the church and you cannot do it speedily with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind? Can't you give your eyes sick to the Lord? Can't you give your alabaster box of ointment to the Lord? Can't you decide and determine, like Ruth, where you go, I will go. Where you die, I will die. Your people will be my people. Your God will be my God. Can't we serve God with all our strength, all our soul, all our mind? He that swears to his own heart and changes not. He that swears to his own heart and changes not. Can you walk with your hand? Can you build with your hand? Can you serve the Lord and serve the church without looking for remuneration? Without looking for pay? Without looking for money? Without looking for convenience or luxury? Is your righteousness greater than the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees? Of religious people? Do you walk uprightly? Do you walk righteousness? Do you speak the truth in your heart? Are you free from backbiting and gossiping and tail bearing? Are you free from evil association? Are you free from doing evil to your neighbor? Where do you stand? Where do you stand? Are you pulling back your consecration from the Lord? You lay your hand on the plow. Are you looking back? How much are you willing to be consecrated to the Lord? Settle everything with the Lord. Be free from.